project. I'm uh, Simon, and this is Rue and Hopo, <coughs> my good uh, team members. Um, our project and our goals for the project is uh, creating a RESTful uh, analytics backend processing IGC files. IGC files is a GPS file stored uh, storing a lot of data. I will show you in detail a little bit later. And we're going to develop a user that we that we front end, close browsing and showing details of the recorded tracks, uh, which is stored at the back end. And we have a web crawler who crawls the web for IPC files and link them to the to the back end and then to the Firebase. So this is uh, what the IGC file uh, contains. It's a lot of information, everything from uh, start point, stop point, altitude, GPS, GPS positions, everything. So this is pretty much what we use to uh, uh, create the data needed to fulfill the task. Uh, this is a little bit of the structure chart about how we get, uh, get the IGC files. We use the crawler. Uh, on a web page, for example, like xContest, which grabs onto the file, puts it to the back end, transports it to the file server, in this case Firebase, and it pre uh, gives us a list of tracks which we can bring back to the back end, and then we will uh, analyze the file and send it back to the front end through the API as I get track with all the information and calculations. Uh, this is a little bit on the front end. Uh, which I've been work, working on mostly. Uh, on the left hand side you have the get tracks and track list, which you can choose uh, tracks you have uploaded. We have a little bit of uh, error with the uploading uh, thing, but uh, it's uh, it can be solved uh, in just a couple of days. So we're looking for a solution there at the moment. Uh, and we have the map view information you can see uh, about, the, about the map. It displays everything from the start point to the date to the uh, pilot's name. And we also have added uh, some um, uh, terms in the paragliding uh, community, I think, called thermal, flight, uh, soaring, lift, and sink. So this was a little bit new to us. We didn't know a lot about the physics of uh, paragliding, so we had to do a lot of research on how this worked. So as you can see, we'll show it on the web page later, we can calculate uh, time spent uh, in lift when you're going up. In thermal is when you go up in a circle and sinking and everything. Uh, yeah. Uh, also, we have uh, displaying wind direction and wind speed, which was a big uh, problem for us because it's uh, not easy uh, to calculate the uh, wind speed and wind direction just with data of GPS points. But uh, Hoponair has us as a solution, and it's just uh, a matter of uh, hours before we have it uh, ready for the web page, but not now, unfortunately. So. Oh, uh, in this project, I'm, be really, I'm mainly be responsible for the backend uh, framework and uh, assisting channels to finish the frontend. Uh, this is our backend structure, as you can see. Uh, the main three parts is uh, three API. First is, uh, is to analyze IG strike data to get the accurate time bound events and uh, save them as IG metadata. data. Uh, the second part, the second part is that uh, we, uh, the API will upload in the files to the Firebase, and the last part is uh, getting the list of tracks from Firebase and then return it to the uh, front end to display it. Yeah. Uh, um, the next I want to talk about is the backend security and the unit test. Uh, this is uh, the backend. This is the security process uh, sequence, sequence diagram. As you can see, uh, when, front, when front end wants to use the API, he, uh, the front end usually needs to send the UID to the backend. But uh, it's not safe if you send it directly. So we created uh, a security security check test security check of file. Um, as you can see in this uh, diagram, when front end, uh, front end first uh, sends the UID to the Firebase, and uh, 
Then if the file base will return the user's token to the front end, then the front end will send the user token to the back end, and the back end uh, will verify this user token via the file base. And uh, then the file base will tell the back end uh, whether this user is valid or not. And uh, uh, if it is uh, scattered for, so it uh, could uh, continue the proof the analysis, uh, the next analysis, yeah. And also we write uh, for each uh, file, we write the unit test. And to test uh, each function, we have write. Um, yeah. uh, this is our analysis progress. Uh, uh, first, we find all the peaks and troughs, as you can see in this picture. Find uh, all the peaks and troughs, uh, yeah. And then we will calculate every average speed, sorry, average speed between every peak and trough. Uh, after we get in this uh, speed, we will detect uh, if the flight is thinking, zero thinking, or lift or thermal. And then uh, we will detect the thawing. Between based on the altitude, uh, mm, yeah. Then uh, we get uh, the initial one time bound events, but we still can't distinguish whether it lifts or thermal. So uh, the the how can we write a function to distinguish is a straight or spiral? So we could uh, recognize it as a lift or thermal. Then we detect the wind direction and. Uh, Finally, we save the results as RGC metadata and upload the RGC metadata to the file base. Yeah. So yes, so um, this is, uh, well, first, I should clarify. These images right here are not from the front end. They are from a mathematical tool called uh, Gergepa. And uh, it's, it's just a tool that uh, I used to um, quickly demo different uh, mathematical models and see if uh, they work or not. And as it also happens uh, to be able to do, it's also very good at visualizing the different things. Um, so what you see here is a marching cylindrical collision check. Um, the marching part of it means that um, it doesn't just check the entire thing at once and then declare either it's straight or either it's uh, whether it's not straight. Um, instead, it'll ch uh, it'll take a chunk and see if that is straight, and then see if the next uh, chunk is also straight. And it'll keep moving up until it finds a discrepancy, like you can see right there. That point is not within the uh, cylinder. Um, and of course, uh, that can be controlled with the radius of the cylinder, which is um, essentially a variable for how straight the actual flight path is. Um, so what happens then is um, that line gets cut off and a new uh, marching cylindrical collision test starts and it goes on until it finds the next uh, problem. Um, there are a couple reasons why we do chunks instead of just like detecting every single point. First of which is that there are like 15,000 points and um, so not only is it a little bit uh, computationally intensive, but it is very computationally intensive because for each step that we take, we have to check all of the different points. And so if you can just lower the amount of steps, then you lower the computational uh, processing time. Um, so if you had t chosen to do every single point, then you would end up in the red zone over here, which is very bad. Um, there's also uh, another reason why, and that is, um, as I will talk a little bit later, um, um, if you have really small chunks, everything will be straight. It, it's just that it'll be very small chunks and um, so keeping it as larger chunks means that it's uh, a little bit easier to find out what is actually straight and what is a spiral. Um, 
Yeah, I should also mention that this was made possible by using a, um, a vector library, uh, which is found here. Um, there isn't really much of a reason why I didn't make my own, except that reinventing the wheel it just wastes time. Um, I have made uh, vector libraries in the past, but not long ago, and I did not feel like making it again. Uh, so using a publicly available one was just fine. Um, this here is the formula for how you detect the um, collision of any given point inside the cylinder. So Q is the point. Uh, it's a 3D vector. Uh, P1 is the starting point of the cylinder. P2 is the end point, and then R is the radius. All of these three different conditions have to be true, otherwise the point is not um, in the cylinder. So, when we uh, move on to the spirals, um, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. So, um, uh, well first I should say that these are both the same picture, they're just taken from different angles, um, so that it's easier to see the 3D object. Um, but if you can see here, the start of it is not nearly as spirally as it should be. Um, if we don't take that into account, because it can technically show up as uh, thermal, then it'll, uh, it'll wreak havoc on the, on the uh, cylinder. So what I do is I have a uh, I check. The moment that I see a thermal starting to happen, I check the vector's angle against all the um, uh, angles, I mean vectors, um, uh, in front of it until it finds a 15 degree angle, and that's officially the start of the spiral. Um, the reason why I chose 15 was because it's a fairly decent number where it has some room for. Um, where it, it's a bit hard to miss it, so uh, it can catch if like it's only a wide uh, degree, and um, it's also divisible by 360. Um, so uh, the main goal is to find the circle on top and the circle on bottom. The circles in between don't really matter just yet. Um, by doing that, we well, first, I should say that to do that, I first detect um, the angle of the beginning of the spiral and find out when it's the opposite direction. Then it will have made a half a turn, and then I'll detect that again. And that's a full circle. And then I run the same function, just backwards, to find the top. Um, uh, what was next? Uh, yes, so then you end up with this cylinder. However, as you can see right here, um, there are some points that lie outside of the boundary. This is because in this particular instance, it's a little bit tilted, so which is very natural in hang gliding because the wind will take you. Um, to compensate for this, we just stretch out the cylinder, which doesn't impact accuracy because it's not really about the... Um, the length of the cylinder, it's more about the width of it than its angle. Oh, excuse me. Um, so yeah, after we extend that, we get the full cylinder, as you can see over there. And that's how we, we detect all the different points using the previous mentioned formula. And the to get the wind speeds, we use the x, y uh, variables of the vector between this point and that point. The x and y uh, is for the uh, wind direction, and the amplitude of that would be like an inaccurate indicator of the wind speed. Um, I couldn't think of many different ways to actually find a, um, an accurate way to calculate wind speed, but um, it should be sufficient. And this right here is the formula for how you find out the angles between two different vectors. And yeah, that's how you detect spirals from straight lines. 
And that's the end of it. And the next I want to uh, display our project. So, yeah. This I out uh, could uh, could uh, count it too. <laughs> so everything from the yeah. login is stored on the Firebase yeah, there. Then we get the threads from Firebase and uh, this is the threads from Firebase as you can see. This is here. Uh, here. Yeah, yeah. This is a file and uh, the database. So our front end uh, gets a list from the back end and uh, after we finish the code, we have deploy deploy our backend in the laboratory server, so we could accept the <coughs> backend API without running our backend program on the computer first. Then we could uh, see the tracks. It display the tracks like uh, and, uh, this one. And as you can see, it displays uh, the and list time thermal, time flight, and the time thinking, and uh, the time sewing. Uh, I could uh, I could verify it a little more. As you can see, this uh, is the status of thinking, and then when you move, you could see the altitude is uh, decreasing. Yeah, so this will be recognized as thinking, and then uh, it moves uh, also here, and uh, because it's uh, because its uh, altitude is uh, increasing and uh, its track uh, is uh, looks like a spiral, so it will be recognized as a thermal. Yeah? So it's that is that is yeah, that's it. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And a uh, little bit about we started as a team of uh, four persons. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one ended up uh, quitting. Uh, didn't talk to us in a couple months, so we just uh, decided to take his tasks as well. Um, and we started to uh, meet up uh, more frequent, every maybe one or two times a week. We met up here at school and did really make good progress at that time, sitting around on a table and discussing and uh, coming to good solutions. And uh, this is the chart, the big top at the right there. Uh, it was uh, last night because we had another screen to uh, which wasn't started yet, so we moved uh, everything into the to the current sprint and uh, just finished them. To, um, so we have uh, finished every everything we started on. And uh, should probably like emphasize that. We did have uh, very clearly defined roles based on our expertise. So I uh, am used to game development, so I know a, a little bit of mathematical stuff and uh, collision testing and stuff like that. Uh, Ryu was um, the king of backends, yeah. and uh, I worked at the, at the front end yeah. and uh, working with Ryu as well for the last uh, last weeks just to connect everything that was yeah. uploaded to the to the back end. And that's the thing that I want to say. Um, so while we did have clearly defined roles, we did spend a lot of time uh, intermi intermingling in each other's like areas because uh, we were so um, we were so social, I guess, and had a lot of meetings. Um, in those meetings, we uh, we often dis discussed different uh, solutions that were outside of our own. Uh, field of expertise and uh, like for example me and uh, Ru we were discussing how you can detect the peaks and uh, whatnot. I had uh, one theory and Ru had another and uh, we ended up going for his and I know that uh, you two have been uh, very communicative uh, because the front end and the back end are so integrally linked and uh, even if you work on the front end you need to know um, quite a bit about the back end. We had uh, a lot of troubles in the state before we could deploy the backend. We was hosting the backend and I uh, was going on the front end on my computer trying to 
figure it out, but after we got the back end up on the server and things started running, we solved the tasks last. That's about it. Any questions? about uh, the Scrum Master was the one guy quitting, so yeah. we had assigned a little bit to other sprints as well. So we started moving a little bit of things right. over to this sprint, so it uh, was kind of there. Yeah. Yeah. And the other question is, you have this very long from October 16 till the 28th, there's just working. Is it because tests are large, or is it also here the case that you were done with the test, but no one reviewed the code, so they were marked as done, or? Yeah, I think so. Uh, maybe a little bit of uh, slack on the marking as done, because we felt we had to meet up and everything, everyone had to go through it. So you can see when we mark things, is usually when we've been working together. Uh, so then we just mark things done when we're finished with the day, and it's uh, like this. Mm -hmm. And also added points when we have a match up as well. So based on your experiences, if you were to redo this project again, what would you change? How would you work differently? I would say probably um, connect the different parts of the project, so the front end and the back end and the Firebase and all that sort of stuff, because um, it did take a while before all of that got connected. And um, we were, like, even though we were helping each other and um, we had knowledge about each other's parts of the project, we did focus our uh, attention like, inwards and working on our parts uh, and then putting them together afterwards. So if we had, I would say that if we had uh, connected them earlier, then it would have been easier for us to both uh, do testing and, uh, uh, and probably uh, like debugging things uh, because in the last week, that has been our main focus. Mm -hmm. Or in the last sprint, I should say. Yeah. 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 Yeah.